Hi everybody, how you doing? For a while you're gonna be stuck with me for a full hour just about. We had some challenges and I ha cannot thank my panel enough for um, being organized, stepping up and being here. We're gonna do a short, short introduction and I'm gonna look at the uh, AV guys. Do we have the, um, oh, where to go? So all I have to do is click. <laughs> awesome. So that's a good way to start this. Um, the goal for today actually is going to be discussing broadly uh, these specific topics about cannabis tissue culture in general. We're going to give a kind of a brief uh, background. We're going to talk about some of the challenges, opportunities, and what we see the future. And before I go into any of the other slides, I wanted to turn it over to the panelists to introduce themselves in hopes that you guys can get an idea of who's speaking with you today and start thinking about some questions and how you might want to direct them. And then um, I'll take us through a, a couple other slides and I'm going to sit down with them and we'll just kind of take it topic by topic. So Justin, you want to start us off? Yeah, sure. My name's Justin Gibbons. I'm the CEO and founder of Apical Biotech. I'm a 25-year California cannabis native. Uh, I've been through all of it, the good, bad, and the ugly. Um, at Apical Biotech, we're essentially trying to bridge the gap between legacy farmers and growers and the scientific uh, groups that are coming into cannabis now that it's more legal. <laughs> my name is Matthew Schneider. I got my master's in agronomy from the University of Florida, and I currently am a tissue culture R&D scientist at Apical Biotech with Justin. I have spent well over 20,000 hours inside of the hood, done many thousands of meristem tip isolations, and have provenably cleaned hoplite and viroid from cannabis cultivars. Hi, I'm Carl Rave. I'm a PhD plant molecular biologist. I got my PhD from the French National Institute of Agronomy and then came to the US at Colorado State University where I worked in plant nutrition on some biotechnology aspects since uh, 13 years now. And more recently I joined Tesoro Genetics, which is a company we are characterizing existing genotypes and breeding for elite varieties. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. And, um, I'm uh, Dr. Hope Jones. I've been in the cannabis industry for just under 10 years, and I have had the pleasure and the opportunity to bring my background in controlled environment ag, um, also as a molecular and cellular biologist, to this industry. And, and really, I'm a grower. I'm a grower at heart. Everything um, that I do in my industry is about growing. And um, I also, even when I'm doing a lot of my um, legislative work, I have the mindset of cultivation and growers in mind and heart because, in my opinion, everything downstream or upstream, however you want to think of it, is dependent on our genetics. Every, everything we do in this industry is about this plant. Yes, the retail is what drives the money, um, but in order to have the best business possible, we've got to have the best genetics, health, and cultivation practices possible, especially as our margins start to get more competitive. So then, this is kind of like a, a day in the week for most of us here. Um, the, the focus on, um, why we're here, it's exciting cannabis. We obviously have this huge market, right? We are talking a lot about clinical studies, the, the medical potential to help thousands or millions. Um, we have research, like low-hanging fruit we've never had before because we have this plant, that this one plant in the entire planet that seems to have so many effects um, on not just human populations, but mammals in general, et cetera. We have hundreds of cannabinoids, yet we still have to um, better understand their roles and characterize. And then we have to understand we're dealing with a lot of problems. We're a brand new industry legally, and we are here on the shoulders of everybody who had this clandestine um, 
industry before us. And now we're coming together and learning to be commercial producers, retail markets, brands. And so, you know, we, it, it, it's kind of a nice problem to have, but we have a lot of them that we need to deal with. And we don't have the academic understanding, you know, decades and decades, if not, you know, uh, 50 to 100 years of research like we do for orchids and a lot of these other, pro um, other plants. So yeah, these are new crop problems. Specifically our genetics, and I'm gonna just go through these and we're gonna, this is what I'm hoping we can kind of have a conversation about. This is not just the four bullet points that I had on the slide, but this is really what we get into when we think about what we have to deal with from the genetic perspective. Everything about those genetics needs to, um, we need to understand epigenetics and what that means and how that affects our decline. We need to also understand the best and practice the best cultivation practices that we can, and we're, we're not quite there. Um, and then we have pest and disease pressures like we've never seen before. Um, and I have a theory as to why that is, and we're gonna talk in some great tip. But when you're in the black market and you're growing um, underground and you're growing on a much smaller scale and you are isolated, you're isolated from other populations, you're other people, very few people walk in your grows. I can tell you on a daily basis the number of tours that owners do through their cultivation facilities is very different than back in the day. And as this is a nascent industry, the idea of uh, putting on pr a PPE or the protective equipment before giving the shows and the tours, making sure that we understand how to properly deal with our tools, et cetera, all of those things matter and lead to our problems that we have to deal with. And th the link on what that has to do with the medical, the research, the yields, the bottom line. All of our problems as a, with this plant and as growers affects everybody in this industry. So we're here to talk about what some of those solutions are gonna be and that's where we're gonna talk about some of the tissue culture pros. Um, we're gonna talk about when it comes to a tissue culture laboratory, whether it's yours, you're interested in it, or whether you're looking to do business with a company because that's going to be one of the more common practices happening around. What should we all be thinking about? What kind of questions do we, uh, might we think about? Because you're the consumer at that, you're the customer if you're talking to a company. What kind of questions might you be wanting to know, um, ask? And then how is a real facility being operated and run? And then once you have these, um, uh, this technology, these skills, what else can we do with those tools, okay? And then um, there's gonna be some discussion on a call to action afterwards. So that's, I'm gonna come back to this slide in just a second. But again, the whole idea is we all wanna get to quality, high consistent, reliable product, and we want the best research and development that we can for our clinical and medical um, um, outputs. And so what we deal with though, right now where we're at, is this playing you think? Could you guys maybe hit that, um, I bet I can't do it. I love how we just read each other, like. Free. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, this is Justin's, by the way, so this is a perfect lead into the panel. The real secret to removing hot plate and viroid. <laughs> that was a couple days later. So we have a lot of misconceptions in the industry, um, and I'm going to let him follow through on the story there um, and talk about yourselves. We're going to kind of uh, just take it maybe one by one, and then uh, we're going to um, go back a few slides. And uh, in the meantime, why Justin tells us the, uh, the history, I'm going to leave that there for right now. So why don't you tell us what was going on with that? <laughs> 
So there's a lot of misconceptions going around about what can and can happen with uh, virus and viroid eradication and uh, or remediation in cannabis tissue culture. Um, there, early on, I would say there was a lot of bad testing first. So knowing what hoplite and viroid was and being able to uh, reliably test for it um, without having false positives or false negatives was um, probably about 2017, 2018. And, you know, a lot of people didn't know about it. So now the community is really much more educated on it and there's a lot more uh, testing labs, testing for it and availability to access those um, unlike before. But remediating it, um, cannabis suffers from maybe some antidotal or observational um, hunches and maybe some folklore. Um, maybe. Maybe. <laughs> so, uh, simply put it, meristematic uh, excision does it reliably. Um, it's just about uh, technique and uh, numbers. There's been a lot of people that uh, have all kinds of different ideas. That idea stemmed from, uh, we heard a client uh, say they can clean it in two days. And uh, they were using gamma irradiation. And I was like, okay, well... Um, I'll believe it when I see it, uh, but, uh, you know, the mutations that would probably happen, right? <laughs> I was like, just look at white papers of several other crops that they've done that in, and they actually wanted the mutations, see what else they could produce. So that, that's where that video stemmed from. But um, cannabis just suffers a lot of that uh, misinformation, and we're really trying hard to combat that. So that, thank you, and I think it was a nice humorous way to be able to illustrate it's one thing to try something, <laughs> it's another thing to maybe believe it um, because it's online. Um, uh, more about the mer meristematic uh, versus nodal, I'm wondering, um, Matt, if you wanted to, you do this on a day-to-day, -day. one of the advantages of having you on this panel is, um, so Matt comes to us, he's been doing tissue culture for a long time, but coming into the cannabis industry, I'd also like to hear about your learn curve in that regard as well. Yeah, so like I said earlier, I got my master's at University of Florida, and there I worked on the genetic transformation of sugarcane. And the methods of which I learned there are not exactly applicable to cannabis propagation, micropropagation that I've learned here. There are a lot of academic standards that are taught that many people just kind of take on face value and think can be applied to every single crop out there. General purpose topics like aseptic technique of operating inside of a laminar flow hood, not contaminating your cultures, definitely applicable. And my time in academia definitely helped learn that. But I also had to untrain myself with a lot of practices that I learned in academia. Namely, just the way that different crops grow in tissue culture, the way you have to plant them inside of the media, the different types of excisions you have to do. Now, he, with my time at Apical, I've spent a lot of time doing meristem tip excision, which is the primary method through which we remediate hoplatin viroid and systemic bacterial infections. This requires you to get underneath a dissection scope and peel back the layers of the meristem tip in order to isolate a non-vascular portion of the plant. Now, it's critical to get a non-vascular portion because the vasculature, the xylem and the phloem, are where viruses and the viroids and systemic bacteria live. So if you make a cut through this vasculature, for example, nodal propagation, traditional cloning, or an improperly excised meristem, you are just further propagating the systemic pathogens inside the plant onto your clean plant. Then you have to grow up your plant. You have to test it repeatedly through a quantitative PCR. And not only do you have to test it once, you have to test it multiple times over a long duration of time. Previous 
presenters talked about low viral loads inside of plants. And this can absolutely be true in the tissue culture plants as well. If you have a really low titer level inside of your tissue culture plant and you test and you sample that plant improperly, you might find that it is a false negative. But if you test that plant three, six, nine months later, after it's grown, you'll find that the hop latent virus has come back. It was never actually removed. And this is a problem that I think is relatively common in the industry where people are claiming to remediate hop latent viroid but still putting out dirty plants. You know, I think it's interesting um, that and because this is a new, um, everything about doing any biotechnology with cannabis is fairly new. So any evidence that we have or lack of evidence, it seems like we have to infer based off of what's happening with other closely related crops. And I do wonder if, given the fact that we don't have most of the groups well, I know all of us up here, we're not academics in, in the sense that we're at a university and we're PIs running our own grants. And my God, I was just literally drooling looking at Punjab's pictures and um, I, had, I enjoyed doing the collaborations with the universities, but we don't have those technologies. So we're looking at how many times do we need to test this, talking to the uh, third party labs, un trying to understand how they validate their testing methods. And um, the companies that I use, and you guys tell me about the labs for testing for these diseases, uh, first of all, they're not going to be the, necessarily the same labs as your compliance labs. And then to get them to talk to us about how they validate, I don't need to know primer sequences, but you should be able to have a conversation with me when it's been validated. So I see our industry in the same situation that the analytical labs were in the earlier days in trying to get our methods validated or at least understood or all on the same page. Do you guys find that you have that same challenge running your facilities or in the past when you have? Oh yeah, definitely. I mean, sampling number one, uh, cross-contamination is a big part of it. Uh, a lot of the money grab happening in cannabis, uh, the inability to work with universities because of federal funding, so they're uh, completely afraid of touching cannabis, um, especially THC cultivars. Um, some of them work with hemp, but not many of them. They still uh, find it too risky. So having access to those things, um, it's a big time problem. It, and I think that's why uh, we have a lot of the problems we do now is because we don't have proper access. We don't have access. Yeah. And Carl, I'm, I'm curious with your background and what you're going to be doing from the biotech side, how do you go about thinking about, okay, so we have the ability to do tissue culture. If we wanted to bring in testing or, or if we're using groups like you, what is it that we can do and what should we know going into it? As Matthew previously said, I think we have to adapt all the protocols to cannabis specifically. We can obviously use protocol established in other crop species or other plant species in order to, to start with. But by experience, what we have seen is when you work with cannabis, it's completely different than other plant species. And, and it's, it's actually very difficult for several reasons. First, because the protocols are not adapted to that plant and because we have a lack of characterization of the genotypes we are growing. Some, it's known that some plant genotypes are very recalcitrant to tissue culturing. In other crop species, we have been able to find some ways to alleviate this issue or to just not work with this kind of genotypes on in-progress trades by breeding. What we would like to do in cannabis, especially using new bi biotechnologies like genome editing, is really to work on a germplasm and improve that one without having to spend time for breeding. Unfortunately, we are not yet there. The technique is new on tissue culturing in cannabis, especially making callus and regenerating real plants from undifferentiated cells is quite tricky, requires a lot of progress, try and errors. And, uh, Obviously, we're all working a little bit isolated because it's not, you know, public domain like in academia. And we will, I think we will benefit a lot by sharing more protocols, more data in order to progress the community as a whole. 
If, um, if, a, if you were to go about, so we were talking earlier and then one of the things that as a lab, uh, a tissue culture company, we have to be very aware, this is just like uh, cloning conventional, what we do when we're doing our multiplication, it should be, an, uh, it should be a, exactly identical to um, the donor plant that we took the cuts from. But there are considerations that we need to take when it comes to mutations if we don't do our practices correctly. And so one of those factors that we need to consider are mutations, DNA variants. And so when it comes to sequencing, how would you go, how, how would you go about um, uh, uh, doing that yourself for your own genetics or if you were to do this um, consulting, let's say, for a group and said, you want to know if they're DNA off typing, what would you advise that they learn to ask? Can you rephrase the question because we have a sound, I cannot. Hear. I know, I get the feedback as well. It's really hard for me to understand you guys. Um, so. So how would you go about doing uh, DNA variance testing and what's the significance? Why is that important? Why should we know about that as an industry? And uh, what kind of questions could you advise them to ask of labs like us? Related to tissue culturing specifically? Tissue culturing and just DNA off types, yes. Yeah, so obviously the tissue culturing is, is a capacity for a genotype to perform well during tissue culturing is based on genes. Either they have genes that allow cells to grow fast, or they have genes that allow regeneration of a different kind of tissue from uh, undifferentiated cells. And we have to characterize the genotypes in order to know which one could be prone to the treatment we want to do. And uh, without a massive characterization of a lot of cultivars, it's very difficult right now to tell you, you know, what we are looking for. And in fact, we have to identify cultivars that are very, very efficient at this in order to then make some correlation with the genome and to identify potential proteins that are really helping any part of the process of tissue culturing. So we can obviously get some of this knowledge from other crops or other plants. Um, but again, the lack of characterization of mm -hmm. cannabis genomes is is very likely a, a, a bottleneck right now. That's right. Obviously, we have seen in previous talks that things are changing. There is much more science on, on the cannabis and more gen genomic data. And I think this will change over the next years. But today, I mean, either you have a genotype that is very prone and you're happy and you can do things, or you have a genotype that is very recalcitrant and you cannot do anything. When I was working on campus in Colorado, uh, basically, my funding source was to grow some local germplasms, and basically, I picked five varieties from Colorado, and none of them re was successful, basically. Mm -hmm. And I know that it's working with other germplasms. So now we have to understand what's the difference between these, and uh, to try to to breed, potentially to breed your germplasm of interest with that one that will trigger a good tissue culturing in your cultivar of interest. Mm -hmm. Right now, yes, we just need to do more research and identify what makes a cultivar amenable to this kind of tissue culturing. And on different aspects of this tissue culturing mm -hmm. require different genes. So we won't be able, I don't think we will be able to find a, a genotype that is good for transformation, regeneration, and for quick propagation or you know, a genotype that roots very easily is also something very important for micropropagation. That's right. It might not be the same germplasm than the one that will regenerate a shoot from a cell. So we have to characterize this, and as a community, we have to find this and hopefully share data, and then we can progress as a, as a community. Hopefully, and then I'm gonna, there's three more slides, and then I'd like to open it up, but the, um, before I do those last three slides, I wanted to ask the two of you guys, um, when it comes to the day-to-day -day running a lab, uh, your experience and anything you want to share with that, and when it comes to training people and the type of individuals who are best in the hood, I thought maybe the two of you could tag team that little bit of conversation. Yeah, sure. Yeah, the uh, number one trait I would look for in a lab technician is their attention to detail. You can always train them to get faster. You can always teach them how to do specific movements, but if they're 
not going to pay attention to the little tiny details, the proper amount of nodes on your micro cutting, making sure your blade doesn't touch the vasculature of your meristem excision, making sure you're putting in 100 microliters of hormone and not 95. <laughs> These little tiny things all add up. And when you have 20, 30 techs running, those mistakes can compound. You need to have good practices in place to make sure that you're not getting your cultivars mixed up, that labeling is being done properly and inventory is properly being managed. Um, yeah, but I would say most people can be trained to be a good technician. It's just, can they be a great technician? They need to have that attention to detail. Do you think trimmers would make good technicians? I think they would because they have to do the detail, you know, for hours at a time. I've been so far removed from the general cultivation That's of true. cannabis that I don't know that. I, I think that trimmers trimmer. might make great technicians, <laughs> actually. <laughs> uh... <laughs> they take too many breaks. I think they might have to train, retrain some habits for that. But uh, we tr we've, we've actually tried that. Uh, but, so what's it like running a lab? Um, small lab or big lab? Well, what do you got? Um, I mean, I've been in all kinds of labs. Uh, I've built small labs, extremely small labs for germplasm uh, storage uh, and just cleaning uh, to put into a high uh, throughput, uh, just traditional nursery production system, uh, and I've designed and built out uh, larger labs. Um, I would say the larger labs a little more uh, difficult because uh, trying to create Gantt charts and production uh, system that uh, works in unison with the cultivators um, that are typically less organized uh, becomes difficult. Also, uh, a lot of the times, uh, market demand uh, affects the larger labs because. Um, the market's always demanding such quick change of what the users How want. How do you keep up on it with TC and being able to pivot in that way? Well, that's, that's the challenge. That's what I'm, uh, so larger lab, that's, those are the challenges. Um, keeping up with it, uh, you have to be extremely organized and you have to plan the cultivars that you want to cultivate or uh, what you're going to put into the nursery months and months ahead of time. Uh, to scale the micropropagation aspect of it to meet those production deadlines. Um, the smaller labs I find uh, are a little bit easier to manage uh, when put into a larger uh, traditional nursery structure um, because those uh, immediate changes or pivots are a little bit easier to manage. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, less mistakes happen. I, I, can, I can say that one of the biggest common problems in traditional nurseries and, and in cannabis in general is um, you have low-level labor that is working on the cuttings and labeling and plugging and a lot of the times they mislabel um, and that happens in the lab and you can imagine if you mislabel in a lab and you're on an eight-month uh, production deadline and you've just scaled thousands of plants that are all the wrong cultivar yep. you know so so having that track and trace is key and having, like you said, that attention to detail. And um, there's other aspects of uh, a facility, if this is something that you're thinking about doing for yourself in-house or if you were to be doing any kind of due diligence on a tissue culture company, the goal for the type of facility when, um, you know, Justin's mentioning small or big, it depends on what the intention is and the purpose and the goal of the company. So when I work with groups on their designs, do they want to become a nursery and provide young plants into the uh, wholesale or the retail markets? Do they want to do research and, or maybe they want to just do their in-house production for elite mother stock? Those factors versus being a large commercial facility, when it's, you're a large commercial facility, and I've done uh, several, many of, actually, many of those designs, one of the things and one of the factors out of all the minis that I have designed, I can maybe count on one hand how many of them actually got built. And one of the biggest mistakes that I've seen when it comes to thinking about doing this in, in, in one's own company is this idea that you can do a lot in a very small amount of space in a very short amount of time. And I want to say all of that in theory is true, 
but not with the, the ideas and the misconceptions that's in the head. So one of the things that you need is you do need to maintain, and everybody knows about having you know the cleaner rooms or a clean room for doing the actual transfers in a laminar flow hood. We, we do need that, that consideration, but does that need to be together with everything or do you need multiple spaces? And so every square footage matters to every owner. And tissue culture, while you produce a large number in a very small footprint, the ramp up to get to that large scale production, if anybody's thinking it's less than six months or a year, you're out of your minds. So I just really, if anything, if you take anything home from that, it is an investment not only on the resources and the financial resources, it is an investment on time. Every strain that we work with, because we are dealing with such a, our own epidemic of diseases and age and epigenic uh, epigenetic decline. It's essentially we have to do a cleanup for every single genetic that we are working with. Even when it comes from seeds, right? Would you guys agree? Even when it comes from seeds, you've seen the seed-borne diseases. We're starting to see actual evidence and data that um, the hoplatin viroid is transmissible by, by the seed, and that makes sense. This embryo came from a infected mother. And so it's important for us to actually understand some of those nuances and time and factors. The other thing I'm going to just jump to so we have time, a good amount of time for, um, oh wait, yep. Um, you know, interaction with you guys and your questions is the type of supplies that we use in consumables. So one of the individuals who is going to be on the panel is actually a vendor. And, and I don't see enough people talking about what goes into the labs, what type of equipment, supplies, consumables. We talk a lot about some of the OPEX, but we don't really spend very much time in the consideration and the factors when it comes to things even like our culture vessels. So our vessels Vessels is like a mini room, an actual room with four walls, a ceiling, and a floor. So what we use for our vessels matters as much as the four walls, the ceiling, and the wall of anyone's grow or retail space. And so that's what this company does. They provide this. They also have micro bags when it comes for um, mushrooms. And when it comes to their filters, and we can kind of maybe leave this on here, has anybody used any of their products before? Or what's your consideration when it comes to vessels, gas? rate. I mean, I know ethylene is terrible for cannabis. And then what kind of equip what kind of a supplies and equipment when you're doing biotech uh, laboratory would you consider? I mean, right off the bat, I am from a business standpoint, and a lot of these uh, facil facilities that we go to, um, at the end of the day, it's about cost. So we have to compare uh, vessel to labor cost. And there's several, several other vessels out there, but this one is uh, extremely efficient um, labor-wise, and um, you know it breathes really well and it keeps out contamination. I've seen things attack tissue culture labs, uh, like thrips. I've seen thrips get inside uh, test tubes before. Uh, people didn't uh, parafilm them, and uh, but then you put parafilm on, they breathe less. You get hyperhedric plants, right? So. These vessels are really good. I like these vessels. Um, they're very efficient, um, but they're also costly as oh, well. And they're far away. And they're far away, and they take forever to get here. And then, you know, you have a global closure, and uh, makes it even harder to get them. So, you know, always have a backup in house as well. Uh, but look at ultimate goal of the lab, and kind of decipher there what makes sense. If you're a really small lab and you're only preserving your own germplasm. Uh, you know, you can get away with magenta boxes and things like that, but depending on the design of the lab and cleanliness of it, you can have higher contamination issues as well. Um, so there are some people out there that just buy cheap deli containers and use micropore tape on the top of them. Uh, and I've seen that work, but also much higher contamination rates with that as well. It's the labor that goes into actually doing that, but it's still, I mean, gosh, I, I did that back in college in the early 90s with the Band-Aid. You just use a hole punch, you stick a one of those small round Band-Aids and you have filtration. And if you think about it at the bottom of the Band-Aid, when you open it, it's sterile, right? So why not? But it's labor that goes into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about you guys? I love micro boxes a ton. They have saved so many cultivars of mine through 
I don't know, various environmental problems, for example, the breathability of the filters on the microbox is critical to your success in cannabis tissue culture. And that was one of the biggest things that I had to unlearn. All of the vessels that I worked with previously, no matter if it was sugar cane or energy cane or potato or hops, none of them had vents. They were all just sealed like GA7 vessels or tube containers or test tubes. Cannabis loves ventilation and the micro boxes work really, really well for it. And it goes through its nutrients in the containers very fast once it has roots, doesn't it? Oh, yeah. When, once they root, they, they just take off. And you can get these micro boxes gamma sterilized from the factory. So you just open up the sleeve. It's like Petri dishes. You don't have to autoclave them or anything like that. But they are re-autoclavable should you want to reuse them and be green. The only factor I think about with them, though, unfortunately, is the um, more concerned environmental side of me is, you know, all the plastic I hope yeah. we can find a solution to that long term. Hemp plastic. Um. <laughs> I'm working more for at the cellular level. So, yeah, so I mean, use I mean, more petri dishes. I would dish. guess that the need of gas exchange is not as dramatic as with a real plant, which is transpiring. Mm -hmm. But, but for, uh, even at the cellular level, you need a uh, gas exchange for maintaining, don't you? Yes, we are growing in petri dishes, so we usually, you know, we put a kind of classic breathable tape mm -hmm. just to allow gas exchange. But I have seen in bigger plants that uh, at the beginning I was growing in vitro uh, small seedlings mm -hmm. in a sealed. Uh, cup. You know, mm -hmm. we were using beer cups, actually, sterile beer cups. It was nice, but it was not breathing at all. And I could see that my plants... Hyperhydric? <laughs> ...didn't like it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I think the micro box is a solution, mm -hmm. the way to go. And um, so I wanted to see if there's any questions out there before we go on asking some questions of each other. But... Um, be better if we didn't do that if there are questions out there by you. So anybody got some questions, please line up and then we'll just take our questions in turn. Hi. Hi. Um, you mentioned preservation of premium mother stock and it, um, it made me think about scale and where tissue culture is overall in scale. So do you see for our industry tissue culture really being a, you know, the, um, a replacement for um, cloning now or eventually, or is it more a strategy as you talked about to, you know, to clean up and preserve, whether it be um, DNA strains or premium mother stock? I'll give my um, answer and then pass it on. How about that? So that's a really good question, and I don't in the immediate, um, and I'm very transparent and honest with everybody I speak to about this, I don't in the immediate see tissue culture replacing cloning, uh, conventional cloning, until we have automation, until there's more companies. So I'm opening up in Arizona a new lab, and one group could max me out from what I could do on a throughput capacity in one day with one order. And so I would never advise a company to go down that route when a company like mine will never close, but let's say it closed, right? Now you lost all of your genetics. Um, and so I think eventually we will get there, however, because it will be more automated, cheaper, faster, and everybody won't be so worried about in the same way and attached to their genetics. With more research time, money, and proof of concept on the ground in the fields by many, many growers, people will eventually trust the genetics that they're buying from the nurseries and they will eventually say, it makes a lot of sense for me to convert my square footage instead of paying the, you know, the overhead, nothing that contributes to the bottom line and their grows to propagation and to mother's space. But I see us still years away from that. Yeah, I mean, the, the market currently is still pretty unstable um, and the lack of federal legalization is going to inhibit the growth of it um, initially. I do see long term, though, uh, in my opinion, the market's going to kind of copy the craft beer market uh, where you're going to have Budweiser dominating likely 85% of the market and the consumers, and you'll have a niche 15% approximately doing the more craft aspect of it. Um, that's not going to happen for a while but maybe five to 10 years from now uh, when cannabis is federally legalized. I do see um, scaled TC labs working phenomenally, 
but that's because they're going to be able to scale specific cultivars that are in high demand uh, and contracted with extremely large-scale growers. Um, so I think it does have a big future, but only with particular groups, and it's also going to take uh, a lot of money to get there because um, you're going to have to invest a lot of money and time into building a large enough lab and then scaling those cultivars to be able to meet that kind of scale and demand. Um, however, on a small scale, uh, it's already here to stay, and uh, almost every cultivation facility now that I see being designed or I'm helping design myself, we're putting a small lab in just to hold germplasm and do cleaning. So it's definitely going to help the craft uh, aspect as well. Now, scaling that, um, they typically change cultivars so often uh, that I recommend sticking with the traditional nursery and being able to do it that way because it's more efficient. Uh, and at the craft level, uh, it's definitely uh, very cutthroat and you need to be on kind of the cutting edge of what's new uh, as far as cultivars and creating that demand. So scaling uh, micropropagation in those situations is not ideal. We could take another question unless the two of you have anything to offer there. How about, how about you? Thanks. I was wondering if there's um, like a best practice emerging. I realize there's more than one way to skin a cat, but basically like for growers or, or doing in-house or service providers doing this, is there a typical way, uh, for example, you could just to take cuttings and do basically micropropagation where you're just putting in a tube and then rooting it or you can then do further steps where you separate, you know, multiply that into five or ten more and then put them in their, their own tubes. Is there a typical process now that the growers are sort of establishing for that kind of thing or is it just one? So you're thing, talking one? in tissue culture or from the conventional um, cloning aspect? For the tissue culture, as opposed yeah, so to when I, one so cut. when we're ramping up for production, there's one mode that we do for multiplication and ramping up when we're just in the cleanup and for ramping up. But when we're talking production, you need to keep a certain percentage in house to meet reoccurring orders. So let's say you have a vessel um, that has 12 X plants in it. When we are in that mode, we might send 75% off for rooting and keep that 25% in-house for in our continued ramp up. And so that material will be available and maintained for us for orders. Did I understand your question correctly? I think so. So essentially one cutting ends up in one tube and gets rooted. It isn't then further. Yeah, we, we need one. We need one clean one that we have demonstrated is not testing positive for any of the diseases that we test for in our panel. And that single explant then can generate thousands and tens of thousands of plants at, thereafter. Okay, so they do chop it up into a bunch of small mm -hmm. ones, basically. Yep. That's typical. Yeah. Okay. So that's, that's definitely in the pro column. <laughs> Over here this time. Yeah, I have uh, two questions. So first question is, um, are you utilizing any sort of endophytes to harden plants off or re-inoculating plants to um, be able to sustain any kind of uh, stress factors or anything? But second question is, um, are you, like, is there any kind of protocol for, like, turning over mothers once you are taking cuttings off of a tissue-cultured mother that you're utilizing that's clean? Who wants that one? Sorry. Oh, yeah, I cannot hear anything. So. Yeah, the, fr the first question I couldn't quite understand. The second question, as far as turnover goes with your mother plants and tissue culture plants, um, it's more of a contamination uh, question. So I often see nurseries become contaminated even if they start clean. It takes three to six months for that to happen. A lot of growers talk about genetic drift. Uh, I think they inappropriately use that term to just talk about um, decline of the mother plants uh, because they're uh, having nutrient issues or have become contaminated with uh, pathogen. I see uh, Pseudomonas often systemically contaminating the plants. So I take an approach where you just have a consistent schedule of replacing the moms from culture so that even if it does happen, you're not really seeing those issues down the line because you're kind of uh, making sure it doesn't constantly happen and then exaggerate through the rest of the um, cultivation cycle. Uh, I recommend about every three months, I see. And I think I understood the first part of your question. And when I'm working with my clients on the hardening and acclimation on their end, 
they're not getting a rooted cutting or a rooted plant from me traditionally in a plug. I'm sending them what we call stage threes. So those are rooted. It's in a different shipping media without sugar. And I teach, um, you know, there's the SOP and protocols that goes with this. But you want to think about the hardening and acclimation process that plant doesn't, it's very easy for these, uh, especially in the propagation team, to get this. Even though they have roots, they don't have the waxy cuticle, and they're not very photosynthetically active because they've been in a high 100% relative humidity, you know, since it was a little baby explant. So that process is still a two to three week process, just like rooting is, and you go through your hardening and acclimation steps in the same way as you do a rooted clone, only these plants come with roots. And it's really about that new first set of leaves, the next set are the ones that are going to have the more uh, active uh, stomata to increase that stomata, or, uh, that photosynthetic activity, and then those new sets, because that those ones that actually go in under the domes, those are not the ones that are hardening. It's that new growth that comes out that's hardening. That's why it takes two weeks regardless. I hope that's what your question was. No, it, it is. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, obviously, the scale up of tissue cloning has to do with automation, as you said. Um, automation also will come with a bunch of data. And um, that data, of course, can be mined for insights. Um, I'm wondering where you think those insights could feed back into the growing process. I'm thinking specifically around uh, epigenetic decline, which, um, you know, by its name we know it has to do with how a plant is 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 grown and um, whether there could be at some point uh, uh, essentially a correlation between what you're seeing with epigenetic decline and methods of growing so that you could essentially be um, feeding back into a grower's knowledge of how they may be um, uh, epigenetically declining their assets over time Okay, so yes, um, <laughs> so that's a big question and I'm gonna take it in parts if you don't mind a little bit because I, I think, first of all, it requires a lot of research. The answer is absolutely. And the data that's necessary, basically we need as an industry, not as a group of, uh, in the niche of tissue culture, but as an industry, every cultivar or chemotype should be sold like with those little sticks that you get at a nursery that tells you approximately the type of light that it needs, et cetera. Well, until we have the biotechnology behind us that has all of the markers, until we have things uh, identified, most tissue culture companies don't have also uh, grows to be able to flower out, at least I don't. And then if, in those other groups that do, oftentimes it's with collaborators and that's oftentimes also when I get called out to consult and I get called out to consult in those situations because these two worlds are not merging well. And there's a problem between taking a clean plant from the lab and, and then taking a um, uh, the same ass um, approach that we take to cultivation. So this is a living organism. It will never be free of everything. It will go through epigenetic decline. We need the data to understand the timeline and that and the stressors that seem to uh, lead to that. And that's going to take years of research by academic institutions. So then you also have these large companies. And I might be getting off on a tangent, but I hope I'm getting there. Just bear with me. So then you also have the larger companies that are putting in more money into R&D, but that's proprietary information. So there's there's got to be a way for us, and then I'm going to turn it over to you here. Um, there's got to be a way for us to generate the data that you want and that you speak to that is necessary because let's get down to it. We're just growing plants here. Just tell me the best way to grow the plants. Tell me how often I need to replace it. And then um, I should be able to have high quality, predictable yields and follow that business model. But until we have the research and development, how could we actually get there? And is there a way to get there faster? And um, Allison Justin um, is going to talk about it in the next talk, but I also want to turn it over to, to Matt and, and um, Justin here because they are also trying to target this because we need a lot more data. Matt, you want to talk about the Dow? 
Oh, yeah. So I don't know how many people here are familiar with a DAO, a D-A-O. It stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization. And it's just basically a group of people uh, grouping together on crypto rails. And we have this vision of creating a DAO where people will come together to contribute funds to fund open source cannabis science. Like we've discussed multiple times here, the traditional academic industry doesn't necessarily mesh well with cannabis due to federal regulations. So it's a lot harder to get federal grants from big companies or the government, for example. But if we can all come together as a group to fund the science that we think is important, I think we can make a lot of good headway. Yeah. Do you agree? So that, with that said, is there a, uh, a part of the question that we didn't get to? No. I, um, of the software that's out there, um, do you have any recommendations in terms of uh, a software that's close in terms of managing TC and also being able to pull data out for enriched insights? Uh, in vitro soft is one that comes to mind, actually, um, and uh, there's not very many out there because it's very different to track. Um, if you guys know of some, jump, um, go ahead and throw it out. We've got about five more minutes and then we need to wrap up. But in vitro soft would be one to come to mind before we go on to the next question. Do you have any others? In vitro soft is pretty standard. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the questions. Oh, sorry, I thought there wasn't another question over there. I was like, we got another question. We only got five minutes. So if there's not any more questions, then I think we might uh, turn it over to the next panel to get ready. Do you have any final thoughts, you guys? For a panel that just got to thrown together. So thank you very much. And I appreciate your time. Thank you. <laughs>